So today, I'm going to tell you the story of how a two-minute Google turned into a one-year adventure that would change the way I look at the world forever. I first realized that I wanted to be an academic when I worked in the private sector. When my manager would give me a task, I would often fall into a deep rabbit hole. I would stay up late at night, probably with some chocolate scattered all over the table, burning the midnight oil. And the next morning, I'd walk into office really proudly, I was a young 20-something, and show my research to my manager, who would proceed to look at me a little puzzled. This was great, but clearly overkill. You didn't need to go into all these details. But for me, that process of going to the root of a problem and digging deep was just so wonderful. And that's when it hit me, oh gosh, I'm in the wrong job. So I took the plunge, went into academia full time, and got university-backed approval to fall into any rabbit hole I wanted to at any point in time. And today, I'm here to take you all down with me, so buckle up. I do research on economics, innovation, and climate change. And I really care about this topic. I spent a part of my childhood in the South Pacific in Fiji Islands, where the threat of climate change and sea level rise was just so real. And even though I was there in the early 2000s, there was a sense of urgency. We have to do something about this. So much so that both me and my younger sister ended up having careers in this field. And as I was thinking through solutions, solar felt like this beacon of hope. Today, it provides some of the cheapest electricity humanity has ever seen. So I had a really simple question. When did solar panels first emerge? Now, this is what I thought would be a two-minute Google, and it turned into a one-year adventure down the deepest rabbit hole I have ever been down, one that would change the way I viewed the arc of human history, our relationship with the climate crisis, our conquest over energy, and how knowledge itself is recorded and passed down. So I was scanning the digitalized records of patents, and I came across one very curious patent. It was describing a sun electric generator. Apparently, if you put this device out in the sun for two days, it can store enough electricity to power a household for an entire week. And the inventor was someone named George Cove, originally from Canada. But here's the catch. I looked at the date on the patent, and it was from 1906. That is half a century before most textbooks will tell you solar was invented. 1906? My heart started palpitating. That is before the television set. That is before cars became popular. And that is only 14 years after America's first coal-fired power plant. It is just so staggeringly early. And then I looked at the photo. That is George Cove, two years later, demonstrating the solar panel on a rooftop in New York. Now, I looked at this photo and I thought, gosh, this looks so much like what we use today. It is tilted just at the right angle to get the sun's rays. It was even a darker color. It was tinted in the characteristic dark tint of solar panels today. And yet, this was more than 100 years ago. I wanted to know more, so I started scanning the internet, and I could only find two other articles that even mentioned George Cove. So I decided to go into the archives and learn about what the journalists were saying about this invention. 
And it turns out that the journalists were awash with excitement. They were saying that coal and oil, they could run out. But the thing with solar is that it's infinite. We have abundant sunshine, and this can free the masses from poverty. And the more astute observers said that, look, for coal and oil, you need to build expensive infrastructure like railroads, pipelines, and electric wires. But here is a technology that you can just put on your rooftop and which can bring electricity immediately. Now remember, back in the early 1900s, the electric power grid only existed in a few major cities and it only served a few households. The vast majority of the world had no electricity. So Wall Street jumped on this. They saw the market potential and they injected 160 million US dollars in today's money to partner with George Cove and start the Sun Electric Generator Corporation. And what was their aim? Let's innovate on the solar panel and sell it so that we can electrify America. However, things would take a dark turn. In 1909, October, George Cove was allegedly kidnapped. He was told, give up your solar patent and stop the operations of Sun Electric Generator Corporation. And in return, you will get 1 million US dollars in today's money and a fully furnished house. Now, I'm on an academic salary and that's a fantastic offer. But George Cove was a better person than me. He allegedly said no and then was released somewhere near Bronx Zoo, hopefully not close to the tigers or the bears. However, two years later, Sun Electric Generator Corporation disappeared from the company records. And as for George Cove, well, he patented a little bit more here and there, but he never went back to solar. The next major breakthrough in solar would happen half a century later with Bell Labs in 1954. At this point, I had to ask myself, what would have happened if George Cove was not kidnapped? What if we worked on solar continuously, without any breaks, from the early 1900s through to the 20s, 30s, 40s, and so on? What would the world have looked like? Because remember, even if George Cove's solar panel was rudimentary, it represented a critical step that of trial and error, of experimenting and building. All innovation happens this way. But in this case, the trajectory was cut short. Now, creating such a complex counterfactual is hard. This is a big what if question. And as an academic, I knew I needed to ground it in something scientific. So I decided to use this. This is Wright's law, the empirical observation that for some technologies, the more we build, the cheaper it becomes. And with solar, with every doubling of production, costs fall by 20%. From 1976 to the present day, this has meant that the cost of solar has fallen by 99.6%. So I thought, let me use this relationship, apply it to the past, and answer this big what if question. And under some assumptions, I calculate that solar would have become the cheapest form of energy in the world in the early 2000s had there been no disruptions, no kidnapping. In reality, this happened in 2017. And this gap matters because in that time, we built fossil fuel infrastructure which contributed to carbon dioxide emissions and which intensified the climate crisis, the heat waves, the flooding, the extreme weather events. But 
Had solar already been the cheapest form of energy in the early 2000s, we would have used that instead. And think about all the emissions that we could have avoided. Now, if I think back on where I was in the early 2000s, I lived in Fiji. I was listening to Spice Girls. Algo's Inconvenient Truth had just come out. And to think that in a parallel universe, my parents could have been installing rooftop solar, maybe my neighbors as well. That was wild. But we can think about this even more deeply. Had solar innovation continued, we would have worked on batteries far, far earlier because batteries and renewable energy are complements. In fact, George Cove had a battery because he knew that it's important to store the solar electricity for the nighttime. One investor told George Cove, George, if you crack that battery problem, I'm all in. Now that sounds like a conversation that we could be having today. But I know what you all are thinking. Sugandha, you didn't tell us. Who did it? Who kidnapped George Cove? And I'm gonna level with you. This was more than 100 years ago, so we don't know for sure, but let me tell you who would have been threatened. Edison Electric by Thomas Edison. They were building out the grid-based model of electricity with wires everywhere. And for them, George Cove's off-grid solar was a huge threat to their business model. Or maybe it was John D. Rockefeller's Standard Oil, one of the largest monopolies the world has ever seen. Their oil was going into power plants that were connecting up to the electric grid, so they wouldn't have liked this plug-and-play off-grid solar model either. Or perhaps it was a Wall Street investor who wanted to see quick returns. Enough of waiting around for solar innovation. This is taking far too long. They maybe just wanted to wrap it up, nip it in the bud. Well, we can't know for sure, but what I can tell you is this. The 20th century was a time of unbridled capitalism. Industrial espionage and sabotage were commonplace so much so that the American government had to introduce regulation to break up the stranded oil monopoly and to make sure businesses act responsibly. And let me tell you one more thing. The science behind how sunshine could be converted into electricity was so new in the early 1900s. Albert Einstein's Nobel Prize winning paper that explained this effect came out around the same time George Cove was working on the solar panel experimentally. So some people thought George Cove's solar panel is mysterious at best, while some others thought it was fraudulent at worst. Now this saga, this whole story, taught me four big lessons. The first being, there is immense power in power. Energy underpins so much of economic production, and whoever controls energy either indirectly or directly controls the world. Oil and gas can be controlled by a few, but solar is the ultimate democratic source of energy. Sunshine is available to all. And this creates a huge opportunity for the masses, but it also creates a threat for the concentrated interests. The second lesson was about history. It was striking to me how forgotten George Cove was. And I work at a university at Oxford, where we work day and night thinking about climate change, and yet his name was not said or uttered in the halls. And this made me think about history, economics, social science, and so many of the stories we hear have a bias towards the winners. George Cove was not a winner in his lifetime, but the technology he worked on 
absolutely was. So when we read things, we need to be critical, not only of the content, but also of what might be missing, the white spaces, the gaps, the omissions, the unsung heroes of the past. And third, the path of innovation clearly is not always linear or smooth. There can be disruptions. And this made me think about what can we be doing today to support the bold ideas and entrepreneurs working towards a future where humanity is safe, prosperous, and the world itself is climate compatible. Today, we know the value of supporting entrepreneurship, innovation, preserving competition, and making sure there is a space for these bold ideas. And fourth, and finally, all this started with the rabbit hole that wonderful process of searching for the details, going deep into the context of a problem and exploration. People like George Cove were visionaries who were so far ahead of their times and dreamt of a solar-powered world. But as the story shows us, they faced immense challenges. And let me tell you this, in your life, you may encounter pessimists and naysayers, but these people live every single day of their lives in the world that has been built by dreamers and optimists. So take heart, plunge into that rabbit hole, explore and dream of the big ideas. Thank you so much.